It's our privilege to sit around the word of the Lord again. How amazing the grace of our Father. And what a blessing for us to be able to hear the voice of the Spirit, understand the word of the Lord, and be strengthened in the inner man by the presence of the Holy Spirit in this day. I've been thinking about sharing something with you that's relevant because it's easy to just take a word and share it with you, but to give you something to think about through the week, that is my goal. I want to thank you for some positive feedbacks. It's always good to know whether things are helping. You don't have to polish my marble. That's not necessary. We just want to thank the Lord for the ability to still be in touch with each one of you in this time of lockdown. And I think we're going to be locked down for quite a while still. So until we meet again, this will be the avenue of communication and we will try to get a better way of communicating with you. I know that there is a big overload of data, there's a big overload of social media and unfortunately we have to use the same platforms to reach you. But we trust that it is still a blessing to you and that you feel and know that we do this because we want you to know that we love you and we want to have contact with you. I was thinking about the scripture in Proverbs 23 verse 7. It says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. It talks about a miser. Actually, we should have started verse 6. It says, Do not eat the bread of a miser, nor desire his delicacies. I think the principle of this person's heart is the issue. It says, As he thinks in his heart, so is he. It means person will act out what he believes in his heart. We also find this with Christians. There's a lot of people that love the Lord. They really love Jesus. But because of the way they think, they make things so difficult for themselves. They make things so complicated for themselves. And it has a lot to do with the indoctrination of our faith. Things we have learned from childhood that have set up pillars and foundations in our lives. We use those foundations to think. We use those foundations to reason. We use those foundations to as a guideline for us to be able to live in the way we, sh we think we should live. And that is important. So I was thinking about Abraham. We have Faith is a big issue and there's a lot of teachings, a lot of books about faith. So I look at Abraham in Romans chapter 4. So we're going to go there to Romans chapter 4. Verse 1, it says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father had found according to the flesh? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Paul likes to take the avenue of giving God all the glory and giving preference to his understanding of who Jesus Christ is and how that applies to our lives. He doesn't want to connect anything with Christ being a reward based on our goodness. Verse 3, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works... The wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. I love that verse. To him who works, it means if somebody works for me, they would expect me to pay them. When I pay them, it's not gracious giving them that money. They deserved it. And we want to break away from the deserving thing when it comes to salvation. We cannot deserve salvation. We cannot deserve the goodness of God. It was His goodness and His love that came to us and that changes us. I do not change so that he can love me. Verse 5, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. I read this so many times and I think, who justifies the ungodly? The ungodly doesn't deserve to be justified. Yet here, the word tells us that God justifies the ungodly. Just as David describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. This is a mystery. And this is a, probably one of the biggest things in the gospel that we preach. That God comes and he justifies the ungodly. And he imputes righteousness to us. It means he puts it to our account. He makes us righteous apart from works. That takes away so many things. The whole root of performance in the church is founded on the premise that I need to work. There's a lot of principles that can construe to working. 
Verse 7, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Now comes the foundation of our faith. It's easy for us, based on our understanding, that we will label ourselves sinners. Once again, here comes the word, and he says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. It means God does not put sin to your account. As a man thinketh such easy. If you do not have, and you and I do not have the ability to apply the word of God into our understanding of who we are, we live from that identity. One of the enemy's greatest tactics is for us not to believe the truth about our identity. And if we live from an identity in a thinking pattern or a fortress of thinking that causes us to to move from a lie, the position in our lives which is not really true, then we have accepted something that makes it difficult for us to walk out our identity in our life in Christ. If we go to John chapter 8, I'm going to read, give you quite a couple of scriptures because I know that the whole idea is, and I have spoken to some of you, is when we read a scripture to pause the video, to discuss it, to go and look at it, and then from there to go forward. And also for you to have things to work through uh, in the week. John chapter 8 verse 31 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It doesn't say if you know the truth. He says you shall know the truth, and by knowing the truth you will be free. He says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I've said that so many times, we ask the question, what is the truth? To me, to a great degree, the truth is a person. His name is Jesus. Jesus is John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So the truth is not just something we know, but it's also a person that we invited into our lives. His name is Jesus. Now, the Jews said this to him. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Classic example of people that rely on their knowledge, understanding, inheritance according to the flesh, have their blessedness and say this is it. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And there he caught them and he probably catches you too. He says, And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, who commits sin? is a slave of sin. Now, we want to look at the identity that we have in Jesus Christ, and we know that a slave works. And to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Can you see that this puts you into a place of expectation based on the wrong foundation? There's nothing wrong with expecting the Lord to bless you, but there's something really big wrong expecting the Lord to bless you because you're doing things right. And that is a dangerous thing to be. I'm not saying we shouldn't do things right. There's a blessing in doing things right. There's a blessing in the works that comes from our faith life in Christ Jesus. But if we work because of something, it's much different than when we work towards something. And if you have these two mixed up, uh, it can just really complicate your spiritual life. Let's go to another book, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, I'm going to read from verse 26. He says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So here we just read that if you commit sin, you are a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever. So if your theology about sin isn't correct, and that causes you to label yourself as a sinner in the sight of God, and if you commit sin, you are a slave of sin, then this scripture will create quite a bit of fear in your life because it says a slave does not abide in the house for it, but a son does. And our desire is, is to be a son. And you might say, but I want to be a son. Then I say, you can be a son, but it, does, it will not come through works. It comes through faith, faith in Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to read something on that a little bit later as well. Verse 27 on Galatians chapter 3 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I just quickly want to mention this. 
I do not believe that this baptized into Christ talks about your water baptism. It talks about what happened to you in your rebirth process. You were born into the Son of God. You were baptized. You put on Christ. You were emerged into the identity of Jesus Christ. For as many of you are baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. What does the Bible teach us about the word baptizo? You put on Christ. If you make a, a pickle, you take the onion, you put it in the salt vinegar solution, and it actually puts on that, that the onion becomes a pickle. When you are baptized into Christ, what did you put on? What happens to you? Now verse 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, this has been a big thing in the church. Actually, one of the verses I want to share last will be probably one of the most profound verses in this topic. But in Christ, we neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, because we are now in Christ. And the sonship that we find is in Christ Jesus. That identity positions us to have that relationship with Jesus. And we need that relationship with Jesus. We need to understand that relationship with Jesus so that we can begin to live that life and negotiate ourselves in this life that has so many problems, that has so many challenges. To have something of God inside of us and to understand that He accepted us. He says, now, I say that the heir, as long as the child not dis, does not differ at all from a slave, although he is master of all. Here we see also there is a criteria of growth. He says, if you do not grow in your identity in Christ and move from a baby being a son, you, although you are in Christ, you will think like a slave. He doesn't say you become a slave. He says, but you will think like a slave. Listen, now I say that the heir which is now you have been accepted, as long as he is a child, not like a child, he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. Here we see that the challenge is our thinking once again. As a man thinketh such easy. If you begin to see yourself in Christ, to begin to see the love that God has for you, that faith can move you to a place of righteousness, and that you have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and that you are now a beneficiary of these promises of covenant that we have now entered into through Jesus Christ. That is the point of the topic. That's where we want to go. Now, if I'm going to read from verse 4, Galatians 4, verse 4, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So, if you want the adoption of sons, there must be a redemption from the law. I use this example so many times. If somebody gives me a spa voucher for 500 Rand, and I go to spa, and I say, I want to buy this groceries, or I want to redeem this voucher, I give that voucher to whoever is in charge at this shopping center and then they would stamp it and it would say redeemed. Now I get the value. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Now we get the value of that redemption. He says, verse 4 is to redeem those who were under the law. It says we were under the law. The law was a guardian until Jesus Christ would come. It means that the law has put us all under sin, which is so because we needed the Redeemer. It identified us as sinners, and it kept us there until Jesus appeared, until Jesus came to us. And when Jesus redeemed us, He redeemed us from the law. He says, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Remember, a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son does. So what do you want to be? You don't want to be a slave. Now, if you don't understand the scripture correctly, and you read that previous one that we've shared that says, that if we commit sin, we are slaves of sin, and you don't know how to apply that righteousness, you are going to accept the definition of being a sinner will give you the identity of a slave, which means that you will not embrace sonship and you won't live as a son. You will not believe that scripture that says you've been redeemed from under the law. And because you are sons, listen to what he says here, verse 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. This is such a liberating truth. 
Our challenge is not to make heaven. Our challenge is what Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Our aim is that the kingdom of God begin to manifest in our natural life. Manifest, first of all, in your personal life. You went to struggle for the kingdom of God to manifest in your marriage if it doesn't manifest in your life. We want the identity of Jesus Christ to bring a freedom into the life of every believer so that we change our mind, we change the way we think about who we are and we understand whom we have become. That is important because it's you are no longer a slave, but a son. Now, what does sonship look like and how does sonship relate to slavery? A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son does. You gave your life to Jesus, that you receive everlasting life. Yes, you did. Is that a life of sonship or is it a life of slavery? I want to read out of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to read from verse 20. And again, the Lord knoweth the reasonings of the wise, that they are vain. Wherefore let no one glory in men, all things are yours. I mean, here comes a scripture that says to you, all things are yours, we do not glory in men. Verse 22, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death, all things present, all things to come, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. That changed the playing field. We live in a time where people run after people. We live in a time where people almost worship people, especially men and women of God, all gifting, all ministry. And it's important for you as a, as a child of God to understand that, yes, we esteem people highly for their gift's sake. It means we honor the gift of God in people. And who do we give the glory to? We give the glory to God. Because everything that every and any man or woman of God have ever taught you in your life comes by the Holy Spirit. It came from the Father Himself and that no man can take glory for it. Therefore, we do not follow people. And here is that story, uh, and you can go and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, some people were following Cephas, which is Peter. Some people were following Paul. And there were like these divisions in the church, which is like these divisions now. The only reason people will follow a man is when they do not know Jesus. If you know Jesus, you will know that man is not following worthy. Be a follower of Christ as I am a follower of Christ. That's what Paul says. Paul says, don't follow me, follow my example. See how Christ impacts my life and let that same impact affect you. We do not follow people. We love people, we like people, and we prefer people. We have a right to preferences, but not to prejudice. At the end of the day, when it comes to our faith walk, when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ, it's about Jesus. Unto Him be all the honor, the glory, the power and the praise. But this scripture, go and have a look at it from verse 21 to verse 23. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It says, all things are yours. All things are yours. Is that the position of a slave or is that the position of a son? It is much more difficult to be free than to be bound. It's much more difficult to be free than to be under the law. The law gives us a set of rules. We follow them. If we follow them, the law says we're blessed. I said this last week. If you want the blessings of the law, if you accept the blessings of the law, you must also accept the curses of the law. If you want to live there, be my guest. I don't want to live there. I want to live in the new thing that Jesus Christ has provided for me, which is a life in Him. A life where all the promises have become mine by the power of the blood and the promise of God. And I don't have to work for those promises. I work because I love Him. I serve because I love Him. I don't serve because I'm a servant. I serve because there's a servant heart in every son and daughter of God. There's a big difference. People that serve from the identity of a slave is a total different person than a person that serves from the identity of a son or daughter. It's almost like a co-owner. It's like this is my father's business. I'm about my father's things. That sounds familiar. Jesus said, I'm about my father's business. So the moment that you and I come into Christ, we will be about our father's business. I'm going to read this in Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to read from verse 19. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. 
if there had been a law given which would have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Verse 22, But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, just think about this. Scripture has confined all under sin. It means that this Bible that I read has confined me under sin. It has confined me under sin. If I do not know my identity, the scripture will confine me under sin. And I will by definition be a sinner and be a slave of sin. But before faith came, we were kept under God by the law, verse 23, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith had come, we know we are no longer under a tutor. This is the thing. If you do not understand who you are in Christ, you are between stations. Es tussen trainer and tussen stations. If you try to keep the law, by, by this time you would know that you can't. Now to him who works, which is trying to keep the law, the wages are not counted as grace but as debt. Do you, so do you want to put God to debt in your life? You want God to owe you things because you do things right? No, it's not necessary. And it's also not possible. We cannot put God to debt. But it is a mindset. The other one is that all scripture confines us under sin. It doesn't matter if, if I'm not born again and I read the word, it, it will convict me of sin. Righteousness and judgment, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. I will feel like a sinner, I will be convicted. Why? So that, I, so that it can point to Christ, so that I can find Christ the Redeemer that redeems me from under this place where I am now confined as a sinner. And when I find Christ, I'm, I don't need the tutor anymore. I, I don't need to be under the law anymore because there is now a new life that I have. If you do not embrace the life of sonship, you will embrace the legalistic world. And this is the hardest thing for my brothers and sisters. No man can keep the law. We cannot please God by obeying the law when we, we are in Christ. And even in the Old Testament time, it was not possible to keep the law. I don't want to talk about keeping the law. I want to talk about being set free from a mindset that is legalistic into a mind of a son and daughter of God so that the application value of your identity brings the kingdom of God into your natural life. It doesn't matter what the world throws against us. As children of God, with the presence of God in our life, we can overcome. The Lord will give us wisdom. The Lord will give us favor. The Lord will provide for us because He said He will never leave us nor forsake us. This is our promise. This is a good time for us not to live in the mindset of a servant or a slave, but to begin to live in the identity of sons and daughters so that our relationship with the Lord is a loving one, it is an honoring one. Obedience comes through love, not through curses on the opposite. Where we worship Him in spirit and in truth, where we are aware of His presence every moment of our lives, where we look at circumstances when we know all things are ours. The Lord is ours. All things are His. And where we can begin then to understand our authority as believers, where we can begin to live out of the authority, where we can speak the things that the Lord says to us, and where our joy can be full, where we have personal victory in our lives, which will now begin to flow through into our family life. My prayer for you is, is that you will be able to change your mind, to live a life of freedom and negotiate yourself through these circumstances with the help of the Holy Spirit. We are really praying for all the people that have lost many things. I know that a lot of people's jobs are in jeopardy. A lot of small business owners still battling. And there's a lot of confusing things about this lockdown thing. And don't get caught up with it. We trust that you will be able to, to overcome. It is important for us to adjust. Change requires adjustment. There's a lot of changes coming. The God of God, the King of Kings, is the one that gives us the ability to change. It gives us the ability to hold on. It gives us the strength to push through. Church in its old identity will never be the same. But when God changes things, it's always for the better. 
If the fire doesn't burn in your heart, the only one that can light it is you. It's easy to fall back. It's easy to be spiritually lazy. If you don't work in a garden, it becomes wild. If you don't work in your life, it will become wild. Keep on working. Keep on applying the principles. Hold on to Jesus. Don't forget to worship Him. Don't forget to pray. Don't forget to read your Bible. Discipline yourself. And may the Lord bless you abundantly. Let me just pray for you. Father, we just want to thank you for your steadfastness. All your promises are yes and amen. There's a lot of things that's not easy for us. Lord, we, we battle with many things. We, we battle to work through information. There's so much conflicting things being said today. It is so difficult for us, Father, to distinguish between truth and lie sometimes. But your spirit is a spirit of truth. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to discern your purpose and plan in our immediate circumstances. Be with your children, Father. Help them through their challenges and battles. Help them to still their fears. Let the word of God reach you well in each one of them. We give you the honor and give you the glory. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.